Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com and the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 115, Sherlock Holmes and the Theater. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strolling man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket officer. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Uh And what a great time it is to join us here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. Uh The French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. And here, just like the fine French champagne, we rise to the occasion once again to bring you an interview show. It's going to be a good one. I, I, I just feel it in my bones. Yes, I certainly hope when we talk to our guest about Sherlock Holmes in the theater that we ask the question that's been on my mind for years and years and years. When it comes to Sherlock Holmes in the theater, where did he sit? Was it row K? Was it row L? <laughs> Was it orchestra? You know, where, where? Was he in the balcony? Where did he say? He seems like a mezzanine kind of guy to me. He doesn't want to cause a fuss, but you know. You may be right, but there's got to be a paper in that somewhere. There must be. There absolutely must be. Well, you know, here we are at the very end of February, beginning of March, depending on when you're tuning into this. And this, I have to tell you, in, in our cadence of podcast, this month always irks me. (laughs) <laughs> because we typically air our show on the 15th and the 30th of every month. And try as we might, we still have not been able to land squarely on February 30th. Mm. And we, we have to truncate it by a few days because of, well, I'm, I'm blaming Julius Caesar and the, the Julian <laughs> calendar. If we can go back that far. Uh, well, I think it's just a question of will and determination. There's no reason why we can't put this out on March 2nd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess that's true, but that would really screw everything up. Oh. It would screw up our billing cycle on Patreon because we have two episodes per month. And by the oh, way, folks, right. if you haven't supported us on Patreon yet, what are you waiting for? I mean, geez mm-hmm. Louise, a dollar an episode? You can't afford that. This is high-quality programming. Mm-hmm. Are we going to play good cop, bad cop here? How's this going to work? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Scott, they've got so much else to do. You know, it's almost income tax time. <laughs> Lighten up. I'm sure next month. Why, next month it'll be spring. It'll be St. Patrick's Day. People will be feeling better. I'm sure then the big money will roll in. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, bonuses and, and, and all the like, the fourth quarter bonuses. Uh, well, anyway, if you want to support us on Patreon, we would be delighted. We would be thrilled to have you mm-hmm. helping us bring quality program because your funds on Patreon help us to produce the show. They pay for our email provider. They pay for our web host. They pay for our bandwidth and, uh, and, and MP3 host, mm-hmm. uh, graphics, uh, updates, all sorts of things that go into the running of a media empire that IHO's mm-hmm. media has become. Um, mm-hmm. And look, even if it's just a dollar a month, two dollars a month, whatever you can afford to show us your support, we'd appreciate it. Just get on Friends, over to go, yeah, go, get, go, go. 
you have no idea, friends, how expensive those tiny little black microfiber cloths are that we use to clean our screens. Why, during the course of a week, we'll go through three or four of them, and we really need your help. Yeah, and we are now broadcasting, uh, I hear of Sherlock everywhere in 4K. That's 30 <laughs> billion colors. You know, that's, and, and I lost count when I was at least 2 billion in and I had to start over. So it was, you know, this is just, it's time well spent. Uh, mm-hmm. so get on over to patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock or f- click on that, uh, support button, that orange support us on Patreon button directly on I hear of Sherlock.com. Yep, and it's not that you're not going to see the benefits of your support immediately, why? Because thanks to your generosity, we will be able to afford um, sound effects. <laughs> and you can see how well that's going over right now. <laughs> the, the crowd loves it. Mm. Um, I'm still waiting for my laugh track. I need one of those in real life. To <laughs> well there you go (laughs) yeah folks you hear how pathetic that is we need more funds (laughs) we absolutely do and as soon as we get that money friends we'll be doing a handstand (laughs) well since we talked to you last we were here on episode 114 talking about escapism and sherlock holmes and of course uh over on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com, our trifle show, we've talked about a whole bevy of uh, issues over there from, oh, uh, the, the, the naming confusion between James and John and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the, the big plot hole, the MacGuffin. You know what the MacGuffin is, don't you, Bert? In Do the barrel best. coronet. So. I much, I very much like corn MacGuffins early in the morning. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yes, of course. Uh, well, and now, <laughs> you know, crime doesn't pay. That's why we have sponsors. The ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex is implementing the will of our people. We're deporting illegal immigrants from Northumbria because it takes more than kebab shops in Winchester to make Wessex great again. But you're not fooled because you know the facts. That's why you collect all ten volumes of the Sherlock Holmes Reference Library from our Wessex Press the 10-volume edition of the Sherlock Holmes stories by Edgar Award winner Leslie S. Klinger. It puts the entire history of Sherlockian higher criticism at your fingertips, with each illustrated volume bursting with scholarly annotations in a robust, signature-sewn, soft-cover binding. Friends, nothing is so beautiful as spring, when weeds and wheels shoot long and lovely and lush. It's the perfect time to reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Well, we are pleased to be joined by one Mr. Tim Greer, a.k.a. the Ragged Shaw in the Baker Street Irregulars. And Tim has had an interest in Sherlock Holmes that spans all the way from age seven when he happened to see a rare TV airing of the 1932 Clive Brook film. Uh, an omnivorous reader with a strangely retentive memory for trifles, as is quoted in The Lion's Mane, he soon purchased that great foundational work of his Holmes library, the now-age comic The Great Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Four years later, having read Watermills the best of Sherlock Holmes till it fell apart, he received the Double Day Complete Edition with the preface by, of course, Christopher Morley, and at that point contract, contracted a full-blown case of Sherlockianism from which he has never desired to recover. Areas of special interest are Holmes's inspirations and legacies, books in Baker Street, 
Sherlockian Theater and Film, and Canonical Combat. Tim teaches detective fiction, Shakespeare, and other subjects at Memphis University School in, that's right, Memphis, Tennessee, where he's a member of the Science Society, the Giant Rats of Sumatra, past recipient of the Beacon Award from the Beacon Society, and he's had his work published in the Baker Street Journal, and he reviewed that, well, that's where he reviewed uh, the Sherlock Holmes Past and Present Conference. And, of course, we saw him at the conference in Chautauqua last year and even heard him give a speech at the BSI dinner. Whew. That's a mouthful. Tim, how do you do all that? Well, it uh, it took longer to do than it did to read. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Barely. I, 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 Barely. I paced myself. <laughs> well done and nicely trilled on that. Giant rats of Sumatra. Wow. I appreciated that very much. I figured the Jeremy Brett fan in you, and we'll get to that in a bit, I, uh, would I appreciate that. On that immediately. <laughs> there you go. So seven years old, and you come across Sherlock Holmes for the first time. Why at seven? I don't, I don't know too many seven-year-olds that are suddenly means, getting into Sherlock Holmes. Is, is there a turn for detective fiction uh, in your house at that age? Uh, my mother was, uh, was a Sherlockian, uh, and still is, uh, but I think it was more just serendipitous. You know, at that time, uh, we're, we're talking about, we will ask our, our listeners to cast their imaginations and or memories, uh, to a time when there were only three channels on the television and, uh, or maybe four if you got the coat hanger strung just right between the rabbit ears <laughs> and you could get Sesame Street, uh, like you were watching it through a snowstorm. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, when cable TV came in, we got, um, we got one additional channel and that ran classic Hollywood films. Uh, so that was where I first saw some of the, um, Oh, earliest Abbott and Costello and old Warner Brothers and the Bowery Boys. And, and this is, uh, this is some of my, uh, most important early education. Or, uh, how, uh, how sad is that? And, um, that included, oh gosh, Warner Olin, Charlie Chan and, uh, Peter Lorre, Mr. Moto. And of course, early Sherlock Holmes. And, uh, somehow this would have been, I guess at that time, a very rare television airing of that Clive Brook film. But, uh, I didn't remember very much about it other than the, um, the using of the match to do invisible ink, how he mm. wets a match with his tongue and, and writes Moriarty's name. So he leaves a message to let Holmes know who killed him. Mm. And, um, also the, uh, the line at the end about, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sherlock Holmes, new laid eggs for sale. I remembered that one, but it had a good shootout in it. I remembered that. And uh, I liked the movie. It was just kind of fast paced and I liked the movie. Wow. So then when I saw the, uh, the now age illustrated comic, I recognized that name. The name of the character, and I remembered liking the movie, so I got the book. I think that was the first book I ever bought with my own money, with my with my allowance, and um, that had two adventures in it: Speckle Band and Boscombe Valley. And uh, it wasn't long after that that I got a hold of a collection of uh, of a few of the short stories, and I, I just read read those uh, into into loose leaf. <laughs> and uh, af- after that, uh, the uh, the Double Day, which I still have that book. Uh, was, uh, it was all over then. That's amazing. Well, you know, between the Bowery Boys and Abbott and Costello and, and all the rest there, it's wonderful to meet someone with a classic education. <laughs> well, that's right. Thank you. They, they, they uh, need to we, teach uh, more of the classics like those these days. I, it's, I know, think so too. I, I, I attribute a great deal of it to, uh, I have a degree in WZTV Nashville. <laughs> Oh, uh, that is wonderful. So when did you find that there are other strange people out there like yourself who hold this same interest? Um, well, let's see. As far as, uh, as far as being Sherlockians, let's see. The first, uh, <laughs> you know, there were family members who, uh, who liked the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, were they, and, uh, were they members of any kind of society? Oh no, we lived in a very small town. There, you know, we're very, very far in a in a very rural setting, and um, it would have been uh, librarians and teachers would have been first. We had some we had some lovely ladies who ran the library in the small town where I grew up, and they were very good about um, getting every Sherlock Holmes thing that I could possibly uh, find out about. You know, in the in the on the dust jacket in the back, you could find the titles of other books. 
Uh, and then you could go beg for those and there's, we'll track it down for you. And, you know, if you want to keep reading, we'll keep, we'll keep feeding your habit. And so they were, they were very kind, uh, to do that for me. And, uh, I had burned my way through, uh, just about, uh, every, uh, edition of the canon and, and various illustrations and so forth that I get my hands on. And then finally I hit, uh, the first book about Sherlock Holmes, not written by Conan Doyle. And I think that was the first time I realized there was, a much larger circle out there than I previously could have been aware of. And, and that book was Sherlock Holmes of Baker street by W S Baring Gould uh, B- BSI. Uh-huh. And so, and, and so over time you, you learn to recognize some of these, some of these names, uh, like Baring Gould, Vincent Starrett, and then you start tracking them down through their writings and, uh, learn a little bit about, um, the larger world of Sherlockian fandom. I think Bert fell asleep. <laughs> no, I'm just getting caught up on my reading. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this book is Bert. really terrific. <laughs> Bert's over there watching the Bowery Boys. <laughs> <laughs> He's more of a Ritz Brothers kind of guy. I have to Could tell be you. You're probably brother. right about that. I forgot. Oh, boy. Well, at anyway, least the I Ritz Brothers. Hall was involved in some way. Hans Hall. You know, how he got those 57 varieties of tomatoes in that can, I'll never know. <laughs> So when did your uh, – obviously there's a lot of uh, visual uh, elements of Sherlock Holmes in addition to the reading, but when did your sights first begin to turn toward the theater? Ooh, um, that was later. Uh, I was in college by then, and uh, one, of our, uh, one of our requirements was uh, a fine arts elective. And uh, so I signed up for uh, an intro to theater class. Um, because it really more than anything else, because it fit my uh, schedule better than any of the other options did. And um, I uh, enjoyed it very much right, as, as it went along. And the, uh, the instructor in the class, who was the director of theater, um, talked me into auditioning for uh, a play, um, which was uh, Bernard Pomerantz's play, The Elephant Man. Oh, wow. And, uh, and I got to play the, uh, ended up, playing the role that uh, John Gilgood plays in the film, uh, Cargom, the hospital administrator. And um, I could had a see great that. Time I could that. see you in that role. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a terrific, I mean, what a great play to get to first cut your teeth on. We had a, we had a, a wonderful cast for it and it was, you know, not your typical college theater affair. It was, I mean, it's a heavy play, but it's, it's got, it's also got its moments of, of great humor to it as well. And so uh, it was a, it was a rich experience to, to first get into the theater on. And, uh, after that, a great many shows, um, over the, over the years, but, uh, and eventually transitioned into, into directing more. I think because I came in as a, as a literature person, uh, my interest was always sort of inclined towards directing and sort of the, the superintending of the story. Uh, at least as much as it was uh, acting or playing a character in the story. And so it was kind of a natural transition to me. What did you think you were going to do as a career when you, uh, when you went to college? Did you think you would wind up in academia? Yeah, I always wanted to, uh, to write and teach. That was never, uh, I never uh, had any uh, real uh, doubt in my mind about that. So when, when did you, have these these two loves of your life theater and sherlock holmes when did you see the those intersect for the first time hmm theater and sherlock holmes um was it was it a sherlock holmes play uh, that you saw maybe or was it a, an opportunity to direct in one a uh, direct one or act in one Oh, well, this will be, I guess this will be a, a somewhat roundabout. This won't be as good of a direct answer as maybe it could be, but I, I you know, now get, get ready to this, this may be controversial. Here we go. <laughs> um, I, the first time I had an opportunity to see anyone, uh, if this counts, doing a stage production of, uh, of a Sherlockian piece, it was the HBO, uh, Telefilm of Frank Langella in Sherlock Holmes by William Gillette, which aired in the, uh, I don't want to say it was about 87 or 88, somewhere yep. in there. And, um, saw that on a, on a big screen at the frat house. <laughs> and, uh, it was a weird frat. No, it was a, it was a weekend. No one else was there. And, um, just happened to be one of those. Um, 
and I was, uh, I had already been doing plays for a while and, uh, I, man, I loved everything about the production. I know that a lot of it's, it's not, it's not a favorite for a lot of Sherlockians, but, uh, I think, uh, from my perspective for what it is and for what it needs to accomplish, I think it's very good. And it's, it's a different way to tell a story, uh, when, when you're live in front of an audience, it, it can't be like a film. It can't be like a TV series and it can't be like a book. It's, uh, those are all just very different ways to get a story across. I think that they have a, a great cast. I love George Morfigan who plays Moriarty in it. He's so schmarmy. Uh, he's, he's a terrific Moriarty for a stage play. And I think Langella does a, a, a commendable job as, as a stage homes and, and probably, not too different from from Gillette, probably not too far removed from from what Gillette would have done, from how arch the performance would have to be. Now, had mm. you had you heard of the Gillette play before you happened to see that HBO uh, version? Had had heard of it and had read the script ah. in uh, in the Apocrypha. Okay, okay. Hmm. You know, I always thought of um, that 1932 Clive Brook film as uh, very much emulating Gillette, particularly in Brooks performance. I, Did, I have to agree. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think one thing that strikes you now, I mean, you can see the whole film on, on, um, on that, uh, internet video, uh, what? website that I'm not sure we can say the name That's of, crazy. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I think you can watch the whole thing on there. To you? One thing, Is that it? Uh, <clears throat> uh, something like that. And, uh, one thing that sort of the, when I saw it again for the first time in a long time there, it struck me how Rathbone like he was in some ways or how Brooke like Rathbone was there. They're very clipped delivery. Mm. And, uh, so the way he sort of the, the set of his head and how he stands, even how he handles props sometimes, um, they're, they have much more in common than they have, uh, uh, they're much more similar than they are dissimilar, uh, which I mean, that's, that's a good review from me. You know, the more you're doing it like Rathbone, that's, that's pretty mm. good. I didn't, I never had put that together and I, I began to see the Rathbone films not long after I saw Clive Brook, but I guess I just never really connected up, um, the similarity between the two of them as much. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, Rathbone in 39 Hound, that was just six or seven years after Clive Brooks Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, do you have a favorite stage Sherlock Holmes? Um, I, it's, it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to pick a, an actor who I've seen do it on stage who I like just head and shoulders above the others. Um, I have a few, I have a few plays that I would say I like better than the, other. that's one of the things that I think you, you can do a great job in a script that's not all that great. And it, it maybe makes your performance come out a little, you suffer a little bit because you just don't have the material to work with that someone else who's just got a really terrific script has. I still like that Gillette play, uh, a, a great deal. Uh, it's, it's a melodrama. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a type of theatrical entertainment we don't expect to see at the theater anymore because it's kind of become the mainstay of movies. Uh, there's a lot of, it's a, it's a serious play with twists and turns and it ends up happily. Uh, and, uh, there's music underlining the action all the way throughout and, you know, telling us how to feel about what's going on, you know, uh, constantly. And it almost seems like we're, we're describing 80% of movies anymore. Mm. Um, versus what we expect at a, at a theater, we'd almost feel like uh, our intelligence is being insulted if music played all the time, like that, you know, that underscoring played all the time. We were like, I, I can decide how I feel about the scene. Thank you. You know, mm. um, much more so than, than, than at, we more forgiving when a movie does it. But, uh, I, for what it is, I like the script a lot. Um, I really like, um, Nolan and Learning's Incredible Murder of Cardinal Tosca, I think, is, is, an, is a delightful script. And, and there are a few others. Um, I like Langella's performance. I like um, also, um, oh, gosh, I don't want to name too many names. Um, Michael Caine? Oh, uh, he was not stage. Did he, did he do Holmes on stage? <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, did you did you the see brilliant, John, the brilliant John swordsmanship Lord? of uh, the brilliant swordsmanship of Reginald Kincaid? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> you, know the, you know the trick there is to say uh, my cocaine, and then you'll have it. Right? Uh, and then presenting my cocaine. Uh, my cocaine. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, I did not see John Wood, but uh, his performance is is very fondly remembered. It seems like by everyone who did see him. I heard it was a little wooden. And, a little oh, wood, a little wooden. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a criticism you hear of almost all of his performances. <laughs> what do you, what do your students make of these things? Which, what, what do you show your, uh, your students? If anything, Sherlock. Well, now in detective fiction, uh, which is a, a senior, uh, literature elective that I teach that, that's a, that's a course where we, we begin with, um, Murders in the Rue Morgue. We begin with Poe and, and what I would consider to be the, the creation of the, uh, early modern detective fiction genre or category, whichever way you want to look at it and, um, go up to and through Sherlock Holmes. And we, we generally make it to about Raymond Chandler and the Lady in the Lake, uh, and, uh, Hammett and the Maltese Falcon stop there. We don't really go much beyond that. If we ever get to do detective fiction too, we'll, we'll move on past it. But, um, uh, of course, a great deal of the class is Sherlock Holmes. Um, uh, oh, easily half of it. Um, there are so many, um, tropes. There are so many, uh, new investigative techniques. There are so many of the formulas, uh, that we have come to, to expect and love, um, and really, uh, see them as variations, uh, in the works of later writers. It's sort of, there's, there's a line of Thomas Middleton's in a play, a Jacobean play called The Changeling, where the villain, after, after he's managed to kill, uh, everyone he wants to kill, and then himself, as he's dying, says, I'll, I'll paraphrase, but it, it's something like, uh, I have drunk all and left no drop for any man to pledge me. <laughs> and after Poe and Conan Doyle, that's, that's, a, you have to feel like, we're, we're close to being able to say that in, in detective fiction. And yeah. it's just, we're, we're trying to think of things that they might not have explored first or to disguise the fact that we are going down a path that someone else has already gone down as carefully as we may. Have, have you ever thought about going down that path? Have you ever thought about writing a play? Have you written a play? Oh, no comment. <laughs> That's a yes. <laughs> well, that's a yes. So tell us about it, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and uh how's the weather up there in detroit scott Be- because uh, one of the you it's know, raining the things, scripts up here one uh, of the <laughs> things that um you know always interests me is how you bring a character like sherlock holmes to the stage now i have not seen the cardinal tosca play that you mentioned but i've seen plenty if somebody asked me how many Sherlock Holmes plays I've seen, I think I would probably say too many because some, mm. you know, just really ha- – most of them, I must say, really haven't worked for me either because – well, usually because of the – you know, they tend to be lampooning one aspect of the character rather than another and the stories I haven't found particularly compelling. But you know, the, the fundamental issue with that is how do you bring – which is why th- some things like – for example, the way the BBC brings to light through that digital photography and cinematography and BBC mm-hmm. Sherlock, this, the process of deduction and makes it real and makes it visual. But how do you, how do you treat, um, you know, it would be almost, it, it's a bit like thinking about Nero Wolf on stage. I mean, how could mm-hmm. you possibly sit in a theater for two hours looking at somebody sitting in a chair? Regardless mm-hmm. of how eloquent they are. I mean, even, even, and you can't take it with you. You know, you've got, um, or is it you can't take it? What's the one? What's the Sheridan Whiteside play? George Kaufman. Is that you can't take it with you? Uh, um, the one where. Oh, no, uh, no, it's the, the man who came to dinner. Oh. So even, you know, even where you have a great sedentary character, an, Ale- an Alexander Wolcott, Orson right, Welles right. kind of character. In fact, Welles played that role. He's right. at least in a wheelchair for a lot of the time, rolling around. Mm hmm. Well, uh, I mean, it, it is an intrinsic challenge in some ways, but I mean, it, it's, is, isn't it, it, well, here's what I think the intrinsic challenge would be that you, you've got your, your finger right on the pulse of is that we're trying to find a way to physically portray and in a compelling way, uh, an internal or mental process. Uh, what's going on inwardly with Sherlock Holmes is what we want to watch and see and look at. And how do you do that? Uh, and, but in, 
I guess the, the, the answer there, if there is an answer is, isn't that subject to the same rules of modern acting laid down by Stanislavski and practiced by pretty much all great 20th century and beyond actors? Uh, you, you can fill your head with these thoughts all you want, but if you don't show me, I don't get it. And how will you show me? It shall be something physical. You must find, you know, who's, who's the ascended master of this? Lawrence Olivier. And there are others we could name, but they're going to, they're going to find a way. It's going to be a, it's going to be a costume thing, a prop thing, um, a, a stance, a pose, a sudden move. Uh, he's going to find a way to show us, uh, the pot coming to a boil and then that sudden flash of inside or whatever. He, he's going to find a way to physically show it to us so we can watch it. Um, or um, another way to say it is uh, you have to take us with you. You, and, you can't just do it. It can't just be you. You have to take us with you. You have to find a way to take us with you. Or or it's not a play anymore because the audience is not in it. And do you think that's a more difficult thing to do on stage or on screen, whether it's the small screen or the big screen? Well, <clears throat> that's a... That's a great question. Because the, um, you know, the, the, the screen actor can get away with, uh, you know, a twitch of an eyebrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in a close up, the camera picks up on that and you understand the subtlety behind it and, and the multitude of meanings it may have. Uh, yep. with the stage, you need more, it seems like more dramatic, more exaggerated gestures. But Gillette, right. you know, we go back to, to Gillette's style. He was a, uh, just a huge proponent of natural, speaking and natural acting. So wh mm -hmm. where's the balance there when you're trying to uh, convey these really uh, subtle emotions, this, this mental state? It's, uh, it, it's, it's tricky. And it, but, but then watch him go in that scene where he investigates Larrabee's parlor in the Gillette right. film. I mean, uh, of all the scenes in the film, it may be the most interesting. And there are some that aren't all that interesting. And there are others that are quite interesting, but that's, that's a tricky thing in that you've, you've got to have just enough ego to know that what, um, how fascinating you are in what you're doing and not so much that you get lost in it and it's not interesting anymore. And we're just going to get on with it, man, get right. on with it. You know, yeah. um, it, it has to, it has to have something underpinning it that makes us want to watch it. So, uh, and, and I, I agree with a point well taken about, the the film actor has has many more in a sense many more uh, words in his vocabulary in that the camera can come in so close and he can get away with little things can say so much on the other hand there has to be great collaboration between him and his director will he get that close up will he be will he be able to do it uh, or will the camera be uh, over here in a medium shot the whole time? Yeah. Um, so uh, there's that. If, if he's allowed to to have that kind of um, that kind of luxury, then it's probably easier on film. On the you know that that's the old saw is that uh, what is it? Then? There are a couple of them. Um, film is art, theater is life, and television is furniture, and then the other one is um, <laughs> is that um, what is it? Film is a film is a director's medium. Hmm. Telev television is a writer's medium theater is an actor's medium oh, that's interesting and so in a sense the uh eventually in, on the stage uh the director is going to have to go away and it's just going to be you and the audience and so if you can ma if you've got your bag of tricks worked out and you can manage it um you you'll be able to convey what you want to convey to the audience because there won't be all that many people in your way it'll just be you and them eventually in a scene like that so hopefully as long as we're on this subject, and, and we mentioned it in your intro, let's touch on Jeremy Brett. I know this moves us away from, um, you know, the, the main thrust of our conversation, which is really Sherlock mm. Holmes in the theater. Um, but it, it strikes me that Brett, who himself was a, a student of Stanislavski or the Stanislavski method, mm -hmm. um, there are scenes in the Granada series where you see the eyes brighten or Again, the eyebrow twitch or something subtle. But what, what did you think of A, Brett's performance in that series and B, that series approach to Sherlock Holmes overall? Well, um, 
will will it be a will it be a great uh, shock to you uh, if I say that it's you know it, pound for pound my favorite adaptation of the Sherlock Holmes stories. I, I love that series. Uh, he's he's a phenomenal actor. Apart from let's let's just set Sherlock Holmes aside for a moment. He's a phenomenal actor. Uh, if you ever get a chance to watch him in. Um, Merchant of Venice with Joan Plowright and Laurence Olivier. Uh, it was filmed right before he began work on Sherlock Holmes. Or if you can watch the episode of, uh, of number 10, I think that's also on that, uh, on that online, uh, streaming service that we almost mentioned. Uh, there was a, there was a show called number 10 that the BBC did about famous prime ministers and each one got a, got an episode. He plays William Pitt the younger in one of them. And it's, it's only an hour long. It's, it's a jaw dropping performance and on so many technical, he has, he has so little time to do what he does and he pulls it off. Like uh, it's difficult to imagine anyone doing it any better. Um, so he's, uh, he's a great example of the kind of the difference between English actor training and American actor training. They spend so much time getting their bag of tricks, uh, honed and polished. Mm. Uh, they learn, they learn to ride and fence and speak and stand and they go to art galleries and they look at statues and paintings and they, um, when they're young, they, uh, they do plays, um, that they're not old enough for yet. And we, uh, just dive in doing the plays and try and go for the, the, uh, the ultimate truth of the scene. And a lot of times we don't, uh, we don't have the mechanics worked out as actors as well as they do. Uh, and so when we have a role come up, in, even in a film over here that, that needs someone who can really handle language, uh, where, where do the casting directors go? Uh, goodbye, American actors. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll get it. We'll get an English actor to play an American character. Um, and that, that sort of thing. So, uh, but I, I think he's phenomenal. He does a great job as Sherlock Holmes. Um, he's got such a huge, um, a huge vocabulary of, of, expressions of gestures and so and, and uh, i mean he's really I, I don't mean to imply that it's a performance without restraint but he's throwing everything he's got at the role and and the character is big enough and complex enough to withstand it yeah uh you you can't in a sense you're you're not going to overload the character with stuff like that because it, it's it's a huge role it's it's as tricky as it's as tricky as hamlet it's as big as pier gant it's you know it's 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 all you could want in a role and he seems to certainly understand it and and go for it the mind and art of sherlock holmes was the subject of the chautauqua conference in september 2016 in a peaceful historic setting such as the chautauqua institution it was right that we celebrated those two things as it's a mecca for adult education particularly in the arts. We were treated to a number of talks, but the first, on the history and future of Chautauqua, reminded us of our own Sherlockian hobby, a hobby that we pursue through the pages of the Baker Street Journal. John Schmitz, the archivist of the institution, reminded us that the entity has always stood for three things, appreciating the Sabbath, big tent inclusiveness, and the automatic formation of a community when we gather. We could say very similar things about being a Sherlockian. We appreciate quiet time away from the busy world, perhaps when we take the time to read the canon and reflect on its many mysteries. The Baker Street Irregulars believe in big tent inclusiveness, and you needn't be a member of the BSI to subscribe to the journal or to attend its various events. And when we gather, we form bonds, whether we create new ones or fortify long-standing ones. The Baker Street Journal is just one way for you to keep up with these traditions and community. It's not required, but it certainly helps as it serves the need of a virtual and intellectual campfire to gather round on a regular basis. Won't you put your mind to the mind and art of Sherlock Holmes in the pages of the Baker Street Journal by subscribing at bakerstreetjournal.com today. It's clear that you've gotten some of your inspiration 
from the Granada series because you in, in, in Chautauqua, when we went to the BSI conference in Chautauqua in, in September of 2016, you gave a wonderful talk on staging Sherlock Holmes. And from your own collection, because you, you actually, uh, did the, uh, the Sherlockian ice bucket challenge for us <laughs> in August of 2014 on the site. We'll have a link to that, uh, in the show notes. Uh, which, by the way, is ihose.co slash ihose115. You can get to uh, the show notes there. Um, but in the video that you uh, you shot, you had the the, uh, the chalkboard, which uh, was similar to the one used in Granada, and you had the um, the file cabinet, that, that wonderful, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, Wood and uh, and, uh, and green leather filing system there. The cartonnier. Yes. Um, and I didn't see a Moroccan table in there anywhere, but you you might want to fill us in on that one too. So oh, it's, uh, um, it's down just below uh, just below frame. Just below frame. So do you have <laughs> do you have a Baker Street set at home? Uh, well, I think you're uh, there where the cartonnier is. You're looking at my office at uh, at school. It's uh, it's kind of uh you you kind of step into uh the sitting room at baker street there uh, on a small scale um but you know you have to have a file cabinet so i mean it might as well be the right file cabinet um no you'll laugh about this part um i love that cartonia it's kind of um, those were the forerunners to the file cabinet and again you have to hand it to mike grimes the set designer for granada who uh, i think found that uh, just a great, another great example of how faithful they were to, to what you find in the canon. So you find in uh, the final problem, uh, in that, in that last letter from the Reichenbach where Holmes writes to Watson and says, the papers that are needed to convict the Moriarty gang are done up in a blue envelope in pigeonhole M. So he's storing papers back at Baker Street in pigeonholes. Um, but when we're filming a uh, TV series, maybe sometimes we don't want to see open pigeonholes with a bunch of papers in them. But did they ever get mileage out of that thing in the Granada series? Drop those uh, drawers and uh, doors and throw whoa, those whoa, boxes whoa, whoa, all whoa. over the place, and they've, they've trashed the place in no time. <laughs> and then uh, you can make it look tidy or you can make it look like a, a disaster area. Um and uh, it's period correct. It answers everything that, you know, it answers the demands of television and the canon. And, you know, uh, kudos to him all over again. Um, and uh, the, those things are, are difficult to find on this side of the pond. So you sometimes uh, your summer project has to be that you just build one. Look at you. So. Ah. So tell us a little bit about the Moroccan table and its presence or absence in certain Sherlockian productions. Well, that is, uh, I think you can find that, uh, first illustrated, <clears throat> excuse me, in, um, in the adventure of the empty house, uh, right after the capture of Colonel Sebastian Moran, uh, the second most dangerous man in London, uh, when Holmes and Watson come back to, uh, 221B and they're looking through my collection of M's is a fine one. And you'll see the, uh, the little, um, six-sided or eight-sided table, I think, depending on who's drawing it. It can change a little. Um, they're uh, just beside Holmes's chair. And, uh, of course, there was quite uh, a vogue all through the Victorian period for all things uh, arabesque uh, and, uh, and trade uh, trade goods from the East, uh, anything that had that sort of that flavor of um, the Levant uh, and so on. And... Um, it, according to Susan Dallinger, our, our good friend and fellow BSI, that uh, was in fact introduced uh, as a piece of the set for William Gillette's uh, play, Sherlock Holmes, which would have already appeared in London uh, and could have been seen by Paget or at least photographs of the production before the, uh, the making of that illustration. Uh, so uh, that could be, uh, along with the name of the page being Billy, that could be another contribution of Gillette into the canon. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to track that one down uh, as an absolute uh, lock, but um, the earliest that I found it is uh, 
is there. And then, um, as you pointed out, uh, Scott, it later shows up in, uh, I believe it's Frank Wiles who, who draws some of the later illustrations where it shows up. He picks up the motif and keeps it alive yeah. in some of the later illustrations, uh, for the strand. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's very distinctive. It's easy to spot. It's a, it's the kind of thing, I guess, if you're an illustrator, you love to draw, but man, set designers latched onto it and you see it showing up in film adaptations and television adaptations. You see it in Peter Cushing's Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, I see it in, in stage sets all over the place. I think maybe people just keep going back to those Sydney Paget illustrations and seeing it there and thinking, oh, that's distinctive and different. And that kind of makes this a, a place unlike other places that, that we might see, uh, you know, if there are five locations in the script or four locations in the script, you know, this will only be in this one location and that'll help, uh, flag this as being Baker Street. And so it, it's used quite a bit, but, uh, that's one of those things I think I mentioned, uh, we, we were laughing about this earlier. When, when I sit, when the curtain goes up or the lights come up and it's supposed to be Baker Street, if I don't see that thing, I'm, I'm disappointed already. I think, well, this might not be good. This, this could be bad. If I do see it, I think, oh, these people have done their homework. We could be, we could be in for a good show. So you never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's encouraging to see the, the, uh, the Moroccan thing. It's almost like there's some kind of brotherhood of, uh, of, of Baker Street set designers out there <laughs> and, and they've all got the word on the street is get the Moroccan table. I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of such a brotherhood. <laughs> now you, you know, you've talked particularly at Chautauqua about the challenges of bringing that Baker Street environment to life. Uh, you know, particularly because your experience of it as a reader in the stories is so different, particularly guided by the pageant illustrations than the experience of a theater goer. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think the, uh, the primary challenge, I mean, this is, this is true in some ways of, of almost any set, but especially uh, we're so in, uh, we're so imprinted with our expectation of, of what goes on in the sitting room at 221B, uh, not just from, from illustrations, but just from, from the, from narrative after narrative after narrative. Uh, and some of them might be, uh, film or television narratives where we've seen it play out. But really, from the canon, probably first and foremost, or at least allow me that little fantasy, um, that that it is in a sense a kind of a huddle, or a, a or a, a triangular sort of huddle. The client, Holmes, and Watson, and we sit in a kind of a circle or a triangle, and we hear the um, the explanation of, of, of these these odd events that have been happening. I can't make any sense out of it. They made me copy out of an encyclopedia and all of a sudden the job dried up. I went to find out, uh, what had happened, but it turned out to be a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. Why is everyone laughing? You know, uh, I'm sorry, we wouldn't have missed this case for the world, you know, but we all sit around a sort of, um, not, not so much around a table, but around an empty space. Um, two, two armchairs on either side of the fire and then the client sits across. Uh, I, I love that scene in BBC Sherlock, you know, when, uh, when we find out about, Mary's deep dark past when John puts the chair down and says, you sit here because this is where they sit. <laughs> You're a client that's now. <laughs> and I am like, that's right. That is where they sit. Um, <clears throat> and, and for us, it, now that if we introduce a, a foreign element, you know, when we're a reader, uh, we're in, we're in there too. Uh, it's, it's easy for us to be in there. We're, we're kind of, we have no physicality, you know, we're, we can go through, we're, we're almost like, uh, Wells's camera as narrator. We can float right through the scenes and go through walls. We can go anywhere the, the voice of the storyteller can take us. But when we're, um, when we're in a theater watching, we're, now we're locked out. The three of them are all facing each other and we're looking at someone's back. Uh, so we have to sort of open that up. We find a way to break that open and yet somehow satisfy uh, the audience's expectation that, you know, if, if we change it too much, it doesn't feel like we're in Baker Street anymore. And that's why you see a lot of these stage sets where Holmes is, is, uh, splayed out on a chaise lounge. Uh, and then on the far side of the room, Watson's doing something, uh, fiddling about with the gasogene and the client's pacing all up and down frantically, uh, worried about what his problem is. And you think, well, this is, I mean, okay, for a, for a minute or two, but let's get this thing buckled down and, and, and get on with it. Um, we need to find a way to sort of um, open that closed circle so the audience can get a look in 
uh, for however long we're going to be here. And that, that's a bit of a challenge. So you see Baker Street with, uh, uh, with so many walls, you know, seven walls, uh, because the room has to be splayed out or butterflied out or whatever, or with no walls at all and a kind of, a uh, abstract, shall we call it, uh, non-representational staging. Uh, there are many ways to approach the problem. Um, and one of the, one of the objectives of that talk, you know, however uh, successful it may or may not have been was to sort of, um, shine a light on the question of what makes some of them work and some of them not work. And it seems like maybe something that didn't work over here, a very similar approach to staging it does seem to work over here. And why is that? And so, you know, how easy it is to get it wrong. Mm. These two sets are so close and this one doesn't seem to work at all, yeah. but the other one does. And so it's tricky. Well, you know, the funny thing is uh, how much risk is associated in not getting Baker Street right for a segment of the audience. I remember two different Sherlockian plays that I've seen over the years, one of which had a suit of armor in the Baker Street setting, <laughs> and and the other of which had a second-story person coming in through the window. And, wow. My uh, goodness. Yeah, both of those were failures. But, you know, um, you, know you think about other things on stage. You think, for example, about uh, My Fair Lady. Uh, you know, which of course was a musical, but mm-hmm. you know, Henry Higgins flat in London, um, is, is generally so beautifully rendered, but then he has things to do. He can go up, uh, a staircase and take a book off a shelf. He has a gramophone right. he can point to. There's a couch where they sit. The housekeeper comes in and out. There's a little singing, a little dancing. So it's really beautifully choreographed. There isn't that much, as you point out, when you talk about, the client's pacing to have something to do. There isn't that much choreography in Baker Street. And right. if I recall, doesn't Professor Henry Higgins also have a Moroccan table? I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised either. <laughs> if he Did, doesn't, he needs one. Didn't you point that out in your Chautauqua talk? Or was that another film I'm thinking of? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think I would have mentioned yet. Henry Higgins in that particular context, but, mm. uh, although I like that show. Sounds like a research um, project. You know, I think, uh, there are a few, there are a few, um, opportunities to, to move things around and sort of put actors all over the image, uh, uh, in Baker Street. Um, you can, you know, make a long arm Watson and bring down the, you know, someone, someone has to go get the index. Someone has to, someone has to pass out on the hearth rug. Someone has, you know, the, you get a, you know, quick, quick ring the bell, you know, bring this, in, you know, we can go high, we can go low, we can go sideways. But after a while, I mean, why are we here? We're here to, we're here to meet the client here. You know, I mean, are, in the end, we're probably here to fulfill some portion of Ronald Knox's outline of the, of the classic Sherlock Holmes story. Mm. There's going to be a demonstration of the Sherlockian method. There's going to be the arrival. We're going to meet the client. We're going to hear the exposition of the case. Maybe during that section, we cross fade to another scene where we see it actually happening. Uh, This is sort of a flashback. And then we come back to Baker street again. Uh, and then we're, we're off and running and maybe, maybe the day you might happen to Oh, I forgot to mention Crucifer of blood. I like very much as a, as a script for a Sherlock Holmes play, which begins and ends yeah. sort of in Baker street, not kind of, there's a prologue at uh, the red Ford of Agra, but it has two uh, very good scenes in Baker street. Yeah. One of the, has that, have you ever seen, has anyone staged the crown diamond? Oh, I think it's been done quite a bit. You know, it's, it's a handy little one act if it's on, on, uh, on one set. Um, it, Cause, it causes. Cause the, yeah. Cause the reason I think about that is that, um, it's in that play that then became the story of the Mazarin, the Mazarin stone where you can see that Conan Doyle, and this was years after the Gillette play, if I remember the chronology of when this was written. Correct borrowing some of what he picked up in terms of Gillette's approach to stagecraft. So that's the point of the play where the wax bust comes back. There's Mm -hmm. a curtain to cut that off or some sort of screen to cut that off from the rest of the scene. A phonograph plays, you know, Holmes and technology, a phonograph, a violin music plays, creating the impression among the gullible gullible, uh, crooks that he's actually in the other room playing his violin for some bizarre reason. He excuses himself to go play his violin uh, instead of actually switching places with the dummy, which he does to theoretically great effect. But that's the only only 
um, moment that I can think of where Conan Doyle actually probably touched something connected to homes in the stage and presenting the, the sitting room. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a really good observation, Bert. And what's, uh, what's interesting kind of to extrapolate from that even more is as scholars have attempted to uh, do a floor plan of 221B Baker Street, of, of the sitting room, there's always been this conundrum of the bow window and the placement of the bedroom and it's almost almost as if there there were these you know these moving slats uh as in stagecraft where the the room physically rearranges itself as scene dictates and um you know we we go through these mental uh calisthenics to try to uh to try to map out uh the 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 study as it as it existed and it, it, it probably was free form. Well, well said. Took, took that one right out of my mouth. The, uh, and you know, there's that one little parting shot, quick reference to a bow window in, um, the barrel coronet. Yes. At the very beginning. And you can get around that one probably because it's just, just briefly mentioned, but the one in Mazarin stone is hard to deal with if you're going to try and do your floor plan of, of 221B yeah. Baker Street because you have to be able to go into it, close it off. Now there's some kind of secret access that gets you back into Holmes's bedroom from the recess around the boat. This is this is getting pretty involved now. Uh, that one's not as easily dealt with. Well said. Well, and I have to imagine that somewhere along the way you've attempted your own um, your own architectural drawing of what the sitting room looked like well we uh we worked on uh quite a few mock-ups uh, when we staged crucifer of blood a few years ago and um we you know again like we um went went over at chautauqua the uh, i think this set really i wish there were a way that you could say well we've come up with our ideal 221b baker street theater set it's going into a uh, warehouse space and anytime we do a Sherlock Holmes play we're going to drag it out and <laughs> bang it back together it's going to be fantastic we're going to do a Sherlock Holmes play every two years um but uh it really has to um has to has to dovetail with the other sets that the adventure needs it has to share backstage space and wing space and so it kind of has to be uh it has to be purpose built i think for the, for the production so yeah. that that's a tricky one so we we went through several manifestations before we got one that uh that we liked for crucifer of blood but i think there's a little uh peek at one of them in um one of my old uh ihos posts about um the smith uh reviewing an article from the smithsonian uh, and Sherlock Holmes, there's a little um, SketchUp model of uh, 221B that yes. I did based on Sidney Paget. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, when we talked to you at Chautauqua, um, we, we very pointedly asked you about your opinion of the Billy Wilder set for the <laughs> private life of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And I just I want to recreate that scene because uh it it, it was worth it's it's worth revisiting. Of course the the, the Billy Wilder Private Life of Sherlock Holmes you had these th- th- this massive expanse of a room, multiple rooms really. Right. Right. Uh, almost looking like something out of a Neil Simon set. Clearly this is after uh the Priory School and uh the enormous <laughs> reward claimed from the Duke of yeah. Holiness because they are uptown living. Yes, and and it was clearly after uh, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemon took the the screen and the Odd Couple and that that wonderful kind of Riverside Drive, you know, massive New York apartment with uh, kind of an indoor um, hanging gardens of Babylon <laughs> effect as you go through all the all the various rooms. Yeah, and and what was it Sherlock Holmes for Dummies uh, called it? Uh, oh gosh, that's great. That's a great excerpt too. He's, he's right on with, he says, oh, um, I can't remember. It's a, uh, it's a long succession of rooms decorated with stylish potted plants. Uh, it's a, that Hanging one. Hanging gardens and, of Babylon. And, uh, it's that one and also, um, Murder by Decree, the 221B set. It's absolutely ridiculous 221B set in both of them. Yeah. And two, and Murder by Decree, I mean, it's virtually, it's a greenhouse. <laughs> they have they have a greenhouse in glass walls in it's a conservatory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Plum. 
Do you yeah. know, I mean, apropos, apropos of nothing, do you know that, that recently, um, I came across this, uh, clip and I realized, you know, Christopher Plummer obviously is Canadian and obviously so is William Shatner. And in listening to this little bit of dialogue, I detected some interesting echoes in Plummer's delivery here. I'm Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Liz Stride, and Catherine Eddowes were slaughtered and their deaths disguised as the work of a madman. And to my everlasting regret, I <laughs> led the murderers straight to Mary. Spock, I <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> I was expecting him to say, there was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> about it. <laughs> Didn't happen. Oh, it was, I, it was the I, madman. I thought I heard the uh, the assassin from the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes yeah. playing the Granada theme in the background. <laughs> Did I hear that at the end? <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? When you look at the different deliveries and the different way the character is expressed on the screen. Um, I, you'll never hear me uh, say uh, anything bad about Christopher Plummer. He's, he's terrific. A but, great actor. Uh, Absolutely. A, a wonderful actor. I will say that the last time there was a Twitter watch along for uh, – Murder by decree that several of us were on. I was I was absolutely sh astonished. Uh, I don't know why I hadn't noticed it before, but I guess the last time I watched it was before I had become so conscious of product placement. <laughs> How many times Coleman's mustard appears in that movie? <laughs> I think it's like five or six times. Something drives by with a with an enormous Coleman's mustard sign on it. It's <laughs> like at the end they're signing off. You know. Donald Sutherland played James Leeds. Uh, Christopher Plummer was Sherlock Holmes. And Coleman's mustard played itself. Uh, it almost should have gotten a powder puff at the end. That was oh, I boy. say, Watson, are you going to have that hot dog plain? <laughs> oh, no, Holmes, not at all. I'm going to have some Coleman's mustard. You squashed my pee. <laughs> Brought to you by Mrs. Buckley. I wanted it here so I could put Coleman's mustard. You squashed my pee. <laughs> Full of country goodness and green... P no, no, we won't say that. <laughs> no. Full of Kelman's mustard and Mrs. Buckley's green peas. We know Sorry. a certain fjord in Norway, near where the cod <laughs> gather. Where in Fender's green shoals. freeze the cod. <laughs> crisp, cum, crisp crumb Ooh. coated crust. High crumb out. <laughs> what? High crumb out. Here under protest, beef burgers. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, for those of you who have no idea what we're babbling about, <laughs> we'll include Welcome a little audio clip in the uh, in the you, Easter egg portion it. of the show, you, and you uh, you'll it. enjoy it. Uh, well, Tim, this has been a wonderful, uh, all-encompassing discussion of Sherlock Holmes on stage, and. I, mean, I feel like we have so much more to talk about with you uh, at some point. Will you come back? Yeah, I would. I would love to come back and uh, and maybe talk about uh, Shakespeare and Shakespeare. Sherlock. Yes, yeah. that's what I'd really yes. like. Yes, yes, yes. That was our original intent, but you know we <laughs> we go where the fjords tell us to go. That's right. Charlie Briggs yeah. follows the the cattle herds <laughs> wherever they lead. Line. Oh, that's... <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll look forward to your additional contributions on the website, too. Oh, thank you. I am looking forward to... I have a little... I've been cogitating on a, on a little um, iHose piece that I, I hope to send your way here before very much longer. Well, you've set it on the air now, so you have to deliver. That's right. Good. I, I, I committed myself there, didn't I? <laughs> Friends, are you tired of stage plays that always get the Baker Street set wrong, with bearskin rugs and lava lamps that have no business being there? That's why your community playhouse needs the new Sherlock Holmes brand Marcel Marceau Mime Theater. 
It taps your audience's greatest asset, their imagination. Detailed photographs show you how to suggest a deadly swamp adder, a spectral hound, and the evil one-legged Jonathan Small. It's the only boxed entertainment system that delivers the three C's. Completely convincing characters. Characters. Just pick the story you prefer and start rehearsing. Why worry about projecting to the back row when you have the Sherlock Holmes brand Marcel Marceau Mime Theater? Available at your local Sherlock Holmes brand retailer today! You know, this is a subject I don't know how we have avoided it for 115 episodes just <laughs> focusing on, on Sherlock and the theater, but it's, there's so much you could talk about. That is true. Uh, this is really an evergreen topic. And, you know, if you think about all the things that have been covered in the Sherlockian universe, the actors, the editions, the cover, the illustrators, the movies, there hasn't, has there ever even been a book about homes in the theater just focusing on that? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm looking over what, at my bookshelf. What a, and I don't see one. What a great author to uh, develop one would be, uh, Timothy Gray. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's, There's that's, an idea. That's a good one. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just looking back at our, uh, our show archives. We, uh, we spoke to Ken Ludwig, of course, a playwright. Mm -hmm. Uh, back on episode 73. Mm -hmm. But that was really the only time we touched on something stage related. Yeah, well, with the exception of Fritz, we talked to Fritz about the well, musical. True, true. Yeah. And it really, Interesting. yeah, those, those were both focused, uh, conversations on one particular, uh, one particular piece of stage work, not, you know, mm -hmm. stage as a, uh, as a topic in and of itself. You know, we haven't been successful, too. We talked about this and tried a little in the past, but we haven't been successful at roping in uh, actors who uh, play the character in various stage productions for one reason or another. So usually they're short runs and people have got to go on and do other things. Oh, you know what? We did, actually. One, one time. One time we did? we did. Episode 10, The Secret of Sherlock Holmes. I was playing. Oh, that's right. In um, what was that playing? Out in the Berkshires. Mm. Um, it was uh, Michael Hammond with uh, Shakespeare and Company, and uh, David Demke in uh, in the title role. Robert Walsh as the uh, director. So yeah, that that was kind of limited. We were trying uh, for a very brief moment in time to, to uh, we're trying to get. Um, oh, geez, it was, uh, David Arquette to join us when he was doing that horrible, uh, send up, the comedic send up of Sherlock Holmes in Chicago. And I think it opened and closed in less than a week mm. to horrible reviews. Well, we have to get working on uh, Will Ferrell. I'll, I'm up for that. <laughs> I would do that in a, in, a, in an instant. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, well what a, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking to Tim. And we've got to explore uh, Holmes and Shakespeare, which uh, you know might be the next topic. That'll be up next, absolutely. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard here, heck, even if you haven't enjoyed it, let us know. Drop, mm -hmm. drop us a note at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. That's our email address, comment mm -hmm. at IHearOfSherlock.com. You can... You can write a comment right on the show notes for this episode, which again is ihose.co slash ihose115. It's all mm -hmm. lowercase. Uh, you can, you can leave a comment on our Facebook page, on Twitter. Um, and there's a, wasn't there something with numbers? I'm not, I'm not good with numbers. There was, it was 774-221-READ. That's 774-221-7323 where you can call us and record a message. And friends, as you go through these different opportunities to send us information, comments, and so on, email, comment at Sherlock, I hear Sherlock dot com, and so on, and uh, Facebook dot com slash I hear of Sherlock, and all the rest. Please follow the instructions. Last episode, we asked you <laughs> if you'd leave a comment on the show page, and somebody mailed me 
the front panel of their LCD screen with the words Balderdash written on the cross it in crayon. And it was really inconvenient for the postman to get that delivered. <laughs> I was I was very surprised that Grace knew how to spell Balderdash. <laughs> They're making three-year-olds smarter and smarter all the time. <laughs> oh, well. Well, whatever you choose to do, however you choose to write to us, we will remain your steadfast correspondents here on the interwebs until we see you next time. And I remain Scott Monty. Yes, and I'm remaindered as Bert Wolder. <laughs> <laughs> the, the game's game afoot! You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. Do you really mean that? I, yeah, so in other words, I, I, I'd start half a second late. Don't you think you really want to say July over the snow? Isn't that the fun of it? It's, it if, you, if you make it almost when that shot disappears, it'll make my... I think it's so nice that, that you see a snow-covered field and say every July, peas grow there. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. We aren't even in the fields, you see. Yeah, we are. We're talking about them growing, and she's picked them. Yeah. <coughs> what? On in July. I don't understand you. Then when must what must be over for July? Um, when we get out of that snowy field. When I was out, we were onto a can of peas, a big dish of peas. When I said in July. Oh, I'm sorry. Was yes, that? always. July, yeah. I'm always past that. You are. Yes. Okay. Well, that's about where I say in July. Can you emphasize a bit in, in July? Why? That doesn't make any sense. Sorry. Um, There's no known way of saying an English sentence in which you begin a sentence with in and emphasize it. Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll go down on you. That's just idiotic if you'll forgive me by saying so. That's just stupid. In July. I'd love to know how you emphasize in and in July. Impossible. Meaningless. I think all they were thinking about was that they didn't want to... He isn't thinking. Well, sir, can we just do one last... Yeah. And it was my fault. I, should, I said in July, if you can leave every July... You didn't say it. He said it. Your friend. Every July? No, you don't really mean every July. But that's a that's bad copy. It's in July. Of course it's every July. It's too much directing around here. Norway. Fish fingers, no, Findus, Norway. We know a certain fjord in Norway, near where the cod gather in great shoals. There, Janste Stangeland. A fraction more on the on that shoals thing, because you roll it around very nicely. Yeah, roll it around, and I have no more time. Know. You don't know what I'm up against, because it's full of, of of things that are only correct because they're grammatical, but they're tough on the ear. You see, yeah. this is a very wearying one. It's unpleasant to read, unrewarding. Because Findus freeze the card at sea and then add a crumb crisp, ooh, crumb crisp coating. Ah, that's tough, crumb crisp coating. I think, no, because of the way it's written, you need to break it up because it's not, it's not as conversationally written. What? Take crumb Take out. Take crumb out. Good. Here under protest is beef burgers. We know a little place in the American Far West where Charlie Briggs chops up the finest prairie-fed beef and tastes... This is a lot of shit, you know that. You want one more? Yeah, more on what beef? beef? You, you missed the first beef, actually, completely. What do you mean, missed it? You're emphasizing prairie-fed. But you can't emphasize beef. That's like he's wanting me to emphasize in before July. Come on, fellas, you're losing your heads. I wouldn't direct any living actor like this in Shakespeare. 
Will you do this? It's impossible. Orson, you did six last year, and by far and away the best, and I know the, the reason. The right reading for this is the one I'm giving it. At the moment. I spent 20 times more for you people than any other commercial I've ever made. You are such pests. Now, what is it you want? No, I think in your depths of your ignorance, what is it you want? Whatever it is you want, I can't deliver because I just don't see it. That was absolutely fine. It really was. You, 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 no money is worth it. 